Hello, book lover. Welcome to our last session of the guided reading of Charles Bronte's The Professor. The Professor. We are reaching the end of this journey. It has been great talking about this last known novel by Charles Bronte, the author of the masterpiece Jane Eyre. It's nice to see another side of her writing career. And Today we're going to be talking, we're going to be reading and talking about chapters 24 and 25, the last two chapters. Uh, but before we do that, let's recap what we talked about last time. So last time we read chapters 21, 22, and 23. And then uh, William Grimsworth received two letters in his lodgings, one written by a female uh, handwriting was from Mademoiselle Henri uh, telling him that she got a new job as a teacher at the English school in Brussels so she's very happy about that that she has found herself um, a situation so she can earn a living and the second letter was from someone that hasn't showed up for a while <laughs> but he was there in the beginning of the novel the very interesting character Mr. Hunston and he says he's coming to Brussels to see William so that's interesting um, and then uh, William well he knows he wants um, Francis as his wife but now that he gave notice at the pensionat, he does not have a job. He does not have a way to provide for them. He cannot ask her to marry him. So he thinks now she has a situation. So if we could combine both our incomes, we could make a living together. But since he had uh, quit his job, he cannot um, ask. He does not have... Um, well, he would not be responsible if he asked her to marry him at this moment. So his, his conscience is torturing him. And he remembers a favor that someone owes him. And that is the boy, uh, I mean, the parents of a boy that he had saved during a boating um, activity while um, as a teacher. So the Van der Huntens, uh, the family, wealthy family of this boy, would like to pay him for having saved their son's life. And he goes there to their house. He hates having to do this, uh, ask for a favor, the return of a favor. But they were not at home. In chapter 22, we read that Pelé and Zoraide got married. And on the very same day, William left the pensionat left those two behind um, and he really wanted to see Francis but on that day he received a strange visitor and yes you know it was Mr. Hansen who came to visit him he went first to the pensionat learned that uh, William had quit his job and left he had left an address so he went to that address to talk to Hansen I mean to William and they have a conversation um William is not in the place of life where Hunston expected him to be, wealthy and settled. That's not a reality. Um, and uh, what else happened? Oh, yes. So um, he returns to the Van den Hunten's house. And this time, they are there. Mr. Hun Van den Hunten is there. And by help of his reference, uh, William gets a new job as an English professor to all the classes of the college in Brussels. So he can finally do what he had been dying to do, ask Francis to marry him. And that's what he does in chapter 23. So um, he's very restless. He's waiting for the right time to visit her when he knows she will be home. He listens to her singing and then um, he, he realizes that she had in fact written a poem about them, about their master-pupil relationship that grew into an admiration and love relationship. 
Uh, and when he asks her to be his wife, she's very surprised in the beginning. Uh, but she uh, says yes, as long as she can keep her occupation as a teacher. And I thought that was very interesting at the time for a woman to uh, hold her ground and to wanting to be financially independent from her husband. Um, and well, William didn't want that in the beginning, but he eventually yields and they accept to have uh, this um, equal relationship both would be working and both would be teachers although William's salary would be higher um, and that is where we left off oh no at the very end of chapter 23 uh, which was quite um, out of character I mean it's very interesting this about his character but it's weird that it only happens now at the very end there's no indication of that before uh, it would be interesting if there had been. But uh, he's been taken over by this melancholy, this dark depression that he calls hypochondria. And for a few days, he, he has um, no energy. He doesn't know what to do. And we talked about it last time, how a big, um, how big happenings such as getting married can cause uncertainties, uh, cause you to doubt yourself, your actions, your worthiness, etc. But he uh, gets over these doubts and we'll see what will happen in chapters 24 and 25. So let's see, let's read the end of William and Francis' journey. All right, chapter 24. One fine frosty Sunday in November, Francis and I took a long walk. We made the tour of the city by the boulevards, and afterwards, Francis being a little tired, we sat down on one of those wayside seats placed under the trees at intervals for the accommodation of the weary. Francis was telling me about Switzerland. The subject animated her, and I was just thinking that her eyes spoke full as eloquently as her tongue, when she stopped and remarked, Monsieur, there is a gentleman who knows you. I looked up. Three fashionably dressed men were just then passing. Englishmen, I knew by their air and gait as well as by their features. In the tallest of the trio, I at once recognized Mr. Hunston. He was in the act of lifting his hat to Francis. Afterwards, he made a grimace at me and passed on. Who is he? A person I knew in England. Why did he bow to me? He does not know me. Yes, he does know you in his way. How, monsieur? She still called me monsieur. I could not persuade her to adopt any more familiar term. Did you not read the expression of his eyes? Of his eyes? No. What did they say? To you, they said, how do you do, Wilhelmina Crimsworth? To me... So you have found your counterpart at last. There she sits, the female of your kind. Monsieur, you could not read all that in his eyes. He was so soon gone. I read that and more, Francis. I read that he will probably call on me this evening or on some future occasion shortly, and I have no doubt he will insist on being introduced to you. Shall I bring him to your rooms? If you please, monsieur. I have no objection. I think, indeed, I should rather like to see him nearer. He looks so original. As I had anticipated, Mr. Hunsden came that evening. The first thing he said was, You need not begin boasting, Monsieur le Professeur. I know about your appointment to Tenena College and all that. Brown has told me. Then he intimated that he had returned from Germany but a day or two since Afterwards, he abruptly demanded whether that was Madame Pelé-Reuter with whom he had seen me on the boulevards. I was going to utter a rather emphatic negative, but on second thoughts, I checked myself and, seeming to assent, asked what he thought of her. As to her, I'll come to that directly, but first I have a word for you. I see you are a scoundrel. You've no business to be promenading about with another man's wife. I thought you had sounder sense than to get mixed up in foreign hodgepodge of this sort. But the lady? She's too good for you, evidently. She's like you, but something better than you. No beauty, though. 
Yet when she rose, for I looked back to see you both walk away, I thought her figure and carriage good. These foreigners understand grace. What the devil has she done with Pelet? She has not been married to him three months. He must be a spoon. I would not let the mistake go too far. I did not like it much. Pelet, how your head runs on Monsieur and Madame Pelet. You are always talking about them. I wish to the gods you had wed Mademoiselle Zoraide yourself. Was that young gentlewoman not Mademoiselle Zoraide? No, nor Madame Zoraide either. Why did you tell a lie then? I told no lie, but you are in such a hurry. She is a pupil of mine, a Swiss girl. And of course you are going to be married to her. Don't deny that. Married. I think I shall, if fate spares us both ten weeks longer. That is my little wild strawberry, Hunsden, whose sweetness made me careless of your hothouse grapes. Stop, no boasting, no heroics. I won't hear them. What is she? To what case does she belong? I smiled. Hunsden unconsciously laid stress on the word case, and in fact, Republican lord hater as he was, Hunsden was as proud of his old sheer blood, of his descent and family standing, respectable and respected through long generations back, as any peer in the realm, realm of his Norman race and conquest dated title. Hunsden would as little have thought of taking a wife from a caste inferior to his own as a Stanley would think of mating with a Cobden. I enjoyed the surprise I should give. I enjoyed the triumph of my practice over his theory, and leaning over the table and uttering the words slowly but with repressed glee, I said concisely, She is a lace mender. Hunsden examined me. He did not say he was surprised, but surprised he was. He had his own notions of good breeding. I saw he suspected I was going to take some very rash step. But repressing declamation or remonstrance, he only answered, Well, you are the best, judge of your own affairs. A lace mender may make a good wife as well as a lady. But of course you have taken her care to ascertain thoroughly that sin since she has not education, fortune or station, she is well furnished with such natural qualities as you think most likely to conduce to your happiness. Has she many relations? None in Brussels. That is better. Relations are often the real evil in such cases. I cannot but think that a train of inferior connections would have been a bore to you to your life's end. After sitting in silence a little while longer, Hunsden rose and was quietly bidding me good evening. The polite, considerate manner in which he offered me his hand, a thing he had never done before, convinced me that he thought I had made a terrible fool of myself and that, ruined and thrown away as I was, it was no time for sarcasm or cynicism, or indeed for anything but indulgence and forbearance. Good night, William, he said in a really soft voice, while his face looked benevolently compassionate. Good night, lad. I wish you and your future wife much prosperity, and I hope she will satisfy your fastidious soul. I had much ado to refrain from laughing as I beheld the magnanimous, magnanimous pity of his meow. Maintaining, however, a grave air, I said, I thought you would have liked to see Mademoiselle Henri. Oh, that is the name. Yes, if it would be convenient, I should like to see her. But he hesitated. Well, I should on no account wish to intrude. Come then, said I. We set out. Hunsden no doubt regarded me as a rash, imprudent man, thus to show my poor little Grisette sweetheart in his poor little unfurnished, in her poor little unfurnished grenier, but he prepared to act the real gentleman, having in fact the kernel of that character under the harsh husk it pleased him to wear by way of mental Macintosh. Remember we talked about this expression in French, grisette, and that was a word that is not in use anymore, but used to mean a French working class girl because of the um, gray um, attire that they used to wear, right? He talked affably and even gently as we went along the street. He had never been so civil to me in his life. 
We reached the house, entered, ascended the stair. On gaining the lobby, Hunston turned to mount a narrower stair which led to a higher story. I saw his mind was bent on the attics. Here, Mr. Hunston, said I, quietly tapping at Francis' door. He turned. In his genuine politeness, he was a little disconcerted at having made the mistake. So he thought she lived upstairs in the attics, but <laughs> he stopped at the, was a little embarrassed by the mistake. His eye reverted to the green mat, but he said nothing. We walked in and Frances rose from her seat near the table to receive us. Her morning attire, morning attire, remember her aunt had passed away, so she was still wearing black morning attire, gave her a recluse, rather conventional, but without very distinguished look. Its grave simplicity added nothing to beauty, but much to dignity. The finish of the white collar and manchette sufficed for a relief to the merino gown of solemn black. Ornament was forsworn. Frances curtsied with sedate grace, looking, as she always did, when one first accosted her, more a woman to respect than to love. I introduced Mr. Hunston, and she expressed her happiness at making his acquaintance in French. The pure and polished accent, the low yet sweet and rather full voice, produced their effect immediately. Hunston spoke French in reply. I had not heard him speak that language before. He managed it very well. I retired to the window seat. Mr. Hunston, at his hostess's invitation, occupied a chair near the hearth. From my position, I could see them both, and the room too, at a glance. The room was so clean and bright, it looked like a little polished cabinet. A glass filled with flowers in the center of the table, a fresh rose in each china cup on the mantelpiece, gave it an air of fete. Frances was serious, and Mr. Hunston subdued, but both mutually polite. They got on at the French swimmingly. Ordinary topics were discussed with great state and decorum. I thought I had never seen two such models of propriety, for Hunston thanks to the constraint of the foreign tongue, was obliged to shape his phrases and measure his sentences with a care that forbade any ex eccentricity. At last, England was mentioned, and Frances proceeded to ask questions. Animated by degrees, she began to change, just as a grave night sky changes at the approach of sunrise. First, it seemed as if her forehead cleared. Then her eyes glittered, her features relaxed and became quite mobile. Her subdued complexion grew warm and transparent. To me, she now looked pretty. Before, she had only looked ladylike. So as she talks about England, she becomes really animated. It's her dream, right, to move to England and to, because of her ancestry, her English ancestry, her mother was English, but she never had much contact with her. And uh, she would like to earn a living in English, in England. And she was very curious about the customs, right? She had many things to say to the Englishman just fresh from his island country. And she urged him with an enthusiasm of curiosity, which ere long thawed Hunston's reserve as fire thaws a congealed viper. I use this not very flattering in comparison because he vividly reminded me of a snake waking from torpor as he erected his tall form, reared his head before a little declined and putting back his hair from his broad Saxon forehead showed and shaded the gleam of almost savage satire which his interlocutor's tone of eagerness and look of ardor had sufficed at once to kindle in his soul and elicit from his eyes. He was himself as Francis was herself, and in none but his own language would he now address her. You understand English? was the prefatory question. A little. Well, then, you shall have plenty of it. And first, I see you've not much more sense than some others of my acquaintance, indicating me with his thumb, or else you'd never turn rabid about that dirty little country called England. For rabid I see you are. I read anglophobia in your eye, in your looks, and hear it in your words. Why, mademoiselle, is it possible that anybody with a grain of rationality should feel enthusiasm about a mere name, and that name England? I thought you were a lady abbess five minutes ago, and respected you accordingly, and now I see you are a sort of Swiss sibyl, with high Tory and high church principles. England is your country, asked Francis. Yes. 
and you don't like it. I'd be sorry to like it. A little corrupt, vino lord and king cursed nation full of mucky pride, as they say in Shire, and helpless pauperism rotten with abuses, warm eaten with prejudices. So see how Hunsden um, considers uh, England, right? He sees it as a corrupt place. Lord and king cursed nation. Remember, he's against all sorts of tyranny. Um, rotten with abuses, warm eaten with prejudices. That's what he thinks of England. You might say so of almost every state. There are abuses and prejudices everywhere, and I thought fewer in England than in other countries. Come to England and see. Come to Birmingham and Manchester. Come to St. Giles in London and get a practical notion of how our system works. Examine the footprints of our august aristocracy. See how they walk in blood, crushing hearts as they go. Just put your head in at English cottage doors. Get a glimpse of famine crouched, torpid on black hearthstones, of disease laying bare on beds without coverlets, of infamy wantoning viciously with ignorance, though indeed luxury is her favorite paramour, and princely halls are dearer to her than thatched hovels. And all these nouns are gained, have received extra significance because they are capitalized. Famine, disease, ignorance, luxury, infamy. So they become larger than the word itself. They mean more. I was not thinking of the wretchedness and vice in England. That's Francis. I was thinking of the good side, of what is elevated in your character as a nation. There is no good side, none at least of which you can have any knowledge, for you cannot appreciate the efforts of industry, the achievements of enterprise, or the discoveries of science. Narrowness of education and obscurity of position quite incapacitate you from understanding these points. And as to historical and poetical associations, I will not insult you, mademoiselle, by supposing that you alluded to such humbug. But I did partly. Hunsden laughed, his laugh of unmitigated scorn. I did, Mr. Hunsden. Are you of the number of those to whom such associations give no pleasure? Mademoiselle, what is an association? I never saw one. What is its length, breadth, weight, value? Huh? Value? What price will it bring in the market? Your portrait to anyone who loved you would, for the sake of association, be without price. That inscrutable Hunston heard this remark and felt it rather acutely too, somewhere, for he colored, a thing not unusual with him, when hit unawares on a tender point. A sort of trouble momentarily darkened his eye, and I believe he filled up the transient pause succeeding his antagonist's home thrust by a wish that someone did love him as he would like to be loved, someone whose love he could unreservedly return. The lady pursued her temporary advantage. Hmm, go, Francis. If your world is a world without associations, Mr. Hunston, I no longer wonder that you hate England so. I don't clearly know what paradise is and what angels are, yet taking it to be the most glorious region I can conceive and angels the most elevated existences, if one of them, if Abdio the faithful himself, she was thinking of Milton, were suddenly stripped of the faculty of association, I think he would soon rush forth from the ever jeering gates, leave heaven and seek what he had lost in hell. Yes, in the very hell from which he turned with retorted scorn. Frances Stone in saying this was as marked as her language. And it was when the word hell twanged off from her lips with a somewhat startling emphasis that Hunston deigned to bestow one slight glance of admiration. He really underestimated her, thought he had. she had no education, no notion of um, literature, art, politics but she proves him wrong and now he sees her with admiration a little bit of admiration he liked something strong whether in man or woman he liked whatever dared to clear conventional limits he had never before heard a lady say hell with that uncompromising sort of accent and the sound pleased him for a lady's lips he would fain have had francis to strike the string again but it was not in her way 
The display of eccentric vigor never gave her pleasure, and it only sounded in her voice or flushed in her countenance when extraordinary circumstances, and those generally painful, forced it out of the depths where it burned latent. To me, once or twice, she had an intimate conversation, uttered venturous thoughts in nervous language. But when the hour of such manifestation was past, I could not recall it. It came of itself and of itself departed. Hunston's excitations she put by soon with a smile and recurring to the theme of disputation said, since England is nothing, why do the continental nations respect her so? I should have thought no child would have asked that question, replied Hunston, who never at any time gave information without reproving for stupidity those who asked it of him. If you had been my pupil, as I suppose you once had the misfortune to be that of a deplorable character not a hundred miles off, I would have put you in the corner for such a confession of ignorance. Why, mademoiselle, can't you see that it is our gold which buys us French politeness, German goodwill, and Swiss servility? And he sneered diabolically. Swiss? said Francis, catching the word servility. Do you call my countrymen servile? And she started up. I could not suppress a low laugh. There was ire in her glance and defiance in her attitude. Do you abuse Switzerland to me, Mr. Hunston? Do you think I have no associations? Do you calculate that I am prepared to dwell only on what vice and degradation may be found in the Alpine villages and to leave quite out of my heart the social greatness of my countrymen and our blood-earned freedom and the natural glories of our mountains? You're mistaken. You're mistaken. Social greatness? Call it what you will. Your countrymen are sensible fellows. They make a marketable article of what to you is an abstract idea. They have ere these so their social greatness and also their blood-earned freedom to be the servants of foreign kings. You never were in Switzerland? Yes, I have been there twice. You know nothing of it. I do. And you say the Swiss are mercenary, as a parrot says, poor Paul, or as the Belgians here say the English are not brave, or as the French accuse them of being perfidious, there is no justice in your dictums. There is truth. I tell you, Mr. Hunston, you are a more unpractical man than I am an unpractical woman, for you don't acknowledge what really exists. You want to annihilate individual patriotism and national greatness as an atheist would annihilate God and his own soul by denying their existence. Where are you flying to? You are off at a ta tangent. I thought we were talking about the mercenary nature of the Swiss. We were, and if you prove to me that the Swiss are mercenary tomorrow, which you cannot do, I should love Switzerland still. You would be mad then, mad as a March hare, to indulge in a passion for millions of shiploads of soil, timber, snow, and ice. Not so mad as you, who love nothing. There's a method in my madness. There's none in yours. Your method is to squeeze the sap out of creation and make manure of the refuse by way of turning it to what you call use. You cannot reason at all, said Hunston. There is no logic in you. Better to be without logic than without feeling, retorted Francis, who was now passing backwards and forwards from her cupboard to the table, intent, if not on hospitable thoughts, at least on hospitable deeds, for she was laying the cloth and putting plates, knives, and forks thereon. Is that a hit at me, mademoiselle? Do you suppose I am without feelings? I suppose you are always interfering with your own feelings and those of other people and dogmatizing about the rationality of this, that, and the other sentiment, and then ordering it to be suppressed because you imagine it to be inconsistent with logic. I do right. Frances had stepped out of sight into a sort of little pantry. She soon reappeared. You do right? Indeed, no. You are much mistaken, if you think so. Just be so good as to let me get to the fire, Mr. Hunston. I have something to cook. An interval occupied in settling a casserole on the fire. Then, while she stirred its contents, right, as if it were right to crush any pleasurable sentiment that God has given to men, especially any sentiment that, like patriotism, spreads man's selfishness in wider circles. 
fire stirred dish put down before it so she she's talking to him but she and arguing very rationally i think and mr hunston is putting on this facade and uh, um disagreeing with everything she says but she does not let um um her uh fire go down and in all this while she's making ready the the table for for their for the tea were you born in switzerland i should think so or else why would should i call it my country and where did you get your english features and figure i am english too Half the blood in my veins is English. Thus, I have a right to a double power of patriotism, possessing an interest in two noble, free, and fortunate countries. You had an English mother. Yes, yes. And you, I suppose, had a mother from the moon or from utopia, since not a nation in Europe has a claim on your interest. On the contrary, I'm a universal patriot, if you could understand me rightly. My country is the world. Sympathy so widely diffused must be very shallow. Will you have the goodness to come to table? Monsieur, to me who appeared to be now absorbed in reading by moonlight. Monsieur, supper is served. This was said in quite a different voice to that in which she had been bandying phrases with Mr. Hunston. Not so short, graver and softer. Francis, what do you mean by preparing supper? We had no intention of staying. Ah, monsieur, but you have stayed, and supper is prepared. You have only the alternative of eating it. The meal was a foreign one, of course. It consisted in two small but tasty dishes of meat prepared with skill and served with nicety. A salad and fromage francais completed it. The business of eating interposed a brief truce between the belligerents, but no sooner was supper disposed of than they were at it again. The fresh subject of dispute ran on the spirit of religious intolerance which Mr. Hunston affirmed to exist strongly in Switzerland, notwithstanding the professed attachment of the Swiss to freedom. Here Frances had greatly the worst of it, not only because she was unskilled to argue, I think she's very skilled, okay, she was not only because she was unskilled to argue, but because her own real opinions on the point in question happened to coincide pretty nearly with Mr. Hunston's, and she only contradicted him out of opposition. At last she gave in, confessing that she thought as he thought, but bidding him take notice that she did not consider herself beaten. No more did the French at Waterloo, said Hunston. There is no comparison between the cases rejoined Francis. Mine was a sham fight. Sham or real, it's up with you. No, though I have neither logic nor wealth of words, yet in a case where my opinion really differed from yours, I would adhere to it when I had not another word to say in its defense. You should be baffled by dumb determination. You speak of Waterloo. Your Wellington ought to have been conquered there, according to Napoleon, but he persevered in spite of the laws of war and was victorious in defiance of military tactics. I would do as he did. I'll be bound for it, you would. Probably you have some of the same sort of stubborn stuff in you. I should be sorry if I had not. He and Tell were brothers, and I'd scorn the Swiss, man or woman, who had known of the much enduring nature of our heroic William in his soul. If Tell, William Tell, if Tell was like Wellington, he was an ass. Does not ass mean body? asked Francis, turning to me. No, no, replied I. It means an esprit fort. And now, I continued, as I saw that fresh occasion of strife was brewing between these two, it is high time to go. Hunston rose. Goodbye, said he to Francis. I shall be off for this glorious England tomorrow. And it may be 12 months or more before I come to Brussels again. Whenever I do come, I'll seek you out, and you shall see if I don't find means to make you fiercer than a dragon. You've done pretty well this evening, but next interview you shall challenge me outright. Meantime, you're doomed to become Mrs. William Crimsworth, I suppose. Poor young lady. But you have a spark of spirit. Cherish it, and give the professor the full benefit thereof. Are you married, Mr. Hunston? asked Francis suddenly. No, I should have thought you might have guessed I was a Benedict by my look. Well, whenever you marry, don't take a wife out of Switzerland, for if you begin blasphemy Helvetia and cursing the cantons, 
Above all, if you mention the word S in the same breath with the name tell, for S is Baudet, I know, though Monsieur is pleased to translate it as Spri Fort, your mountain maid will some night smother her Breton, Bretonin, even as you, even as your own Shakespeare's Othello smothered this demona. I am warned, said Hunston, and so are you, lad, nodding to me. I hope yet to hear of a travesty of the Moor and his gentle lady, in which the part shall be reversed according to the plan just sketched. You, however, being in my nightcap. Farewell, mademoiselle. He bowed on her head, absol hand absolutely like Sir Charles Grandison of that, on that of Harriet Byron, adding, death from such fingers would not be without charms. Mon Dieu! murmured Frances, opening her large eyes and lifting her distinctly arched brows. C'est qu'il fait des compliments? Je ne me suis pas attendu. She smiled, half in ire, half in mirth, curtsied with foreign grace, and so they parted. So it was all a big joke. He was just testing her, making her fiercer and fiercer, and he wants to make her fiercer than a dragon ne next time, which is quite interesting. Um, and here, yes, uh, she says, don't ever marry a Swiss girl, or she will murder you just like your own Shakespeare's Othello smothered the Simona. Uh, and then uh, Hunston says, I look forward to watching this play, a Travis tie, like a, a different turn of events than the real Shakespearean play in which um, the Moor and the gentle lady, so the Moor, Othello, um, uh, murdered Desdemona, but in this um, inverted play, then the lady would have killed the man. No sooner had we got into the street than Hansen collared me. And that is your lace mender, said he. And you reckon you have done a fine magnanimous, magnanimous thing in offering to marry her? You, a scion of Seacombe, have proved your disdain of social distinctions by taking up with an ouvrière. And I pitied the fellow, thinking his feelings had misled him and that he had hurt himself by contracting a low match. Just let my just let go my collar, Hunston. On the contrary, he swayed me to and fro, so I grappled him round the waist. It was dark, the street lonely and lampless. We had then a tug for it, and after we had both rolled on the pavement and with difficulty picked ourselves up, we agreed to walk on more soberly. Yes, that's my lace mender, said I, and she is to be mine for life, God willing. God is not willing. You can't suppose it. What business have you to be suited so well with a partner? And she treats you with a sort of respect too and says monsieur and modulates her tone in addressing you actually as if you were something superior. She could not evince more deference to such a one as I, for she favored by fortune to the supreme extent of being my choice instead of yours. Hunston, you're a puppy, but you've only seen the title page of my happiness. You don't know the tale that follows. You cannot conceive the interest and sweet variety and thrilling excitement of the narrative. Hunston, speaking low and deep, for we had now entered busier street, desired me to hold my peace, threatening to do something dreadful if I stimulated his wrath further by boasting. I laughed till my sides ached. We soon reached his hotel. Before he entered it, he said, Don't be vainglorious. Your lace mender is too good for you but not good enough for me. Neither physically nor morally does she come up to my ideal of a woman. No, I dream of something far beyond that pale-faced, excitable little Helvetian. By the by, she has infinitely more of the nervous, mobile Parisienne in her than of the robust Jungfrau. Your Mademoiselle Henri is in person, chétif, in mind, sans caractère, compared with the queen of my visions, you indeed may put up with that minois chiffonné, but when I marry, I must have straighter and more harmonious features, to say nothing of a nobler and better developed shape than that perverse, ill-thriven child can boast. Bribe serve to fetch you a coal of fire from heaven, if you will, said I, and with it kindle life in the tallest, fattest, most boneless, fullest blooded of Rubens painted women. Leave me only my alpine prairie, and I'll not envy you. With a simultaneous movement, each turned his back on the other. 
Neither said God bless you, yet on the morrow the sea was to roll between us. So, yes, you can tell that Mr. Hunston is jealous of what William has accomplished. Uh, he, after this evening, he has come to admire Frances and to um, know her worth is way above her social standing, but still not up to his ideal of a woman. All right. That's quite an interesting relationship, this two, right? Hunsman and William Crimsworth. They're not even related. Um, they met when uh, William was working for his brother and um, Hunsman was appalled at the way his brother had treated William, the tyranny with which he had treated his brother. So let's see how this narrative will end. Let's take a look at chapter 25, the last chapter. In two months more, Frances had fulfilled the time of mourning for her aunt. One January morning, the first of the New Year holidays, I went in a fiacre, accompanied only by Monsieur Van der Hutten, to the Rue Notre-Dame au Niège, and having alighted alone and walked upstairs, I found Frances apparently waiting for me, dressed in a style scarcely appropriate to that cold, bright, frosty day. Never till now had I seen her attired in any other than black or sad-colored stuff, and there she stood by the window, clad all in white, and white of a most diaphanous texture. Her array was very simple, to be sure, but it looked imposing and festal because it was so clear, full, and floating. A veil, a veil shadowed her head and hung below her knee. A little wreath of pink flowers fastened it to her thickly tressed Grecian plate, and thence it fell softly on each side of her face. Singular to state she was, or had been crying. When I asked her if she were ready, she said, Yes, monsieur, with something very like a checked sob. And when I took a shawl, which lay on the table, and folded it round her, not only did tear after tear course unbidden down her cheek, but she shook to my ministration like a reed. I said I was sorry to see her in such low spirits and requested to be allowed an insight into the origin thereof. She only said, it was impossible to help it. And then voluntarily, though hurriedly, putting her hand into mine, accompanied me out of the room and ran downstairs with a quick, uncertain step, like one who was eager to get some formidable piece of business over. I put her into the fiacre, that's a kind of carriage. Monsieur van der Hutten received her and seated her beside himself. We drove all together to the Protestant chapel, went through a certain service in the common prayer book, and she and I came out married. Monsieur van der Hutten had given the bride away. We took no bridal trip, our modesty screened by the peaceful obscurity of our station and the pleasant isolation of our circumstances did not exact that additional precaution. We repaired at once to a small house I had taken in the Faubourg nearest to that part of the city where the scene of our avocations lay. Three or four hours after the wedding ceremony, Frances divested of her bridal snow and attired in a pretty lilac gown of warmer materials, a piquant black silk apron and a lace collar with some finishing decoration of lilac ribbon was kneeling on the carpet of a neatly furnished though not spacious parlor, arranging on the shelves of a chiffonniere some books which I handed to her from the table. It was snowy fast out of doors. The afternoon had turned out wild and cold. The leaden sky seemed full of drifts, and the street was already ankle-deep in the white downfall. Our fire burned bright. Our new habitation looked brilliantly clean and fresh. The furniture was all arranged, and there were but some articles of glass, china, books, etc. to put in order. Frances found in this business occupation till tea time, and then, after I had distinctly instructed her how to make a cup of tea in rational English style, and after she had got over the dismay occasioned by seeing such an extravagant amount of material put into the pot, she administered to me a proper British repast, at which there wanted neither candies, nor urn, firelight, nor comfort. So see how they have created this cozy home for themselves it's snowy it's cold it's dreary outside it's gray outside but inside the fire is burning there is tea real tea robust tea there's a british repast and she's wearing lilac happy warm colors 
Our week's holiday glided by and we readdressed ourselves to labor. Both my wife and I began in good earnest with the notion that we were working people, destined to earn our bread by exertion, and that of the most assiduous kind. Our days were thoroughly occupied. We used to part every morning at 8 o'clock and not meet again till 5 p.m. But into what sweet rest did the turmoil of each day, each busy day, decline? Looking down the vista of memory, I see the evenings pass in that little parlor like a long string of rubies circling the dusk brow of the past. Unburied were they as each cut gem, and like each gem, brilliant and burning. Remember, this is an old narrator looking back, so it's an older William looking at his life, and he's looking at these memories of them together, working couple, earning their bread with energy and with... Um, wanting to do what they were doing and with their little uh, paradise in their own home with sweet memories. A year and a half passed. One morning it was a fete and we had the day to ourselves. Frances said to me with a suddenness peculiar to her when she had been when she had been thinking long on a subject, and at last, having come to a conclusion, wished to test its soundness by the touchstone of my judgment. I don't work enough. What now? demanded I, looking up from my coffee, which I had been deliberately stirring while enjoying, in anticipation, a walk I proposed to take with Francis, that fine summer day, it was June, to a certain farmhouse in the country where we were to dine. What now? And I saw at once in the serious ardor of her face a project of vital importance. I am not satisfied, returned she, you are now earning 8,000 francs a year. It was true, my efforts, punctuality, the fame of my pupil's progress, the publicity of my station had so far helped me on. While I am still at my miserable 1,200 francs, I can do better and I will. You work as long and as diligently as I do, Francis. Yes, monsieur, still calling her monsieur, calling him monsieur. Yes, monsieur, but I am not working in the right way and I am convinced of it. You wish to change. You have a plan for progress in your mind. Go and put on your bonnet, and while we take our walk, you shall tell me of it. Yes, monsieur. She went, as docile as a well-trained child. She was a curious mixture of tractability and firmness. I sat thinking about her and wondering what her plan could be when she re-entered. Monsieur, I have given Minnie, our bonne, leave to go out to, that's their uh, servant, their maid, as it is so very fine, so will you be kind enough to lock the door and take the key with you? Kiss me, Mrs. Grimsworth, was my not very op opposite reply, but she looked so engaging in her light summer dress and little cottage bonnet, and her manner in speaking to me was then, as always, so unaffectedly and suavely respectful that my heart expanded at the sight of her and a kiss seemed necessary to content its importunity. There, monsieur. Why do you always call me monsieur? Say, William, I can't pronounce your W. Besides, monsieur belongs to you. I like it best. Minnie having departed in clean cap and smart shawl, we too set out, leaving the house solitary and silent. Silent at least, but for the ticking of the clock. We were soon clear of Brussels. The fields received us, and then lanes remote from carriage resounding chaussée. Ere long we came upon a nook, so rural, green and secluded, it might have been a spot in some pastoral English province. A bank of short and mossy grass, under a hawthorn, offered a seat too tempting to be declined. We took it, and when we had admired and examined some English-looking wild flowers growing at our feet, I recalled Francis' attention and my own to the topic touched on at breakfast. What was her plan? A natural one. The next step to be mounted by us, or at least by her, if she wanted to rise in her profession. She proposed to begin a school. We already had the means for commencing on a careful scale, having lived greatly within our income. We possessed, too, by this time, an extensive and eligible connection, in the sense advantageous to our business. For though our, our circle of visiting acquaintance continued as limited as ever, we were now widely known in schools and families as teachers. When Frances had developed her plan, she intimated in some closing sentences her hopes for the future. If we only had good health and tolerable success, 
we might, she was sure, in time realize an independency, and that perhaps before we were too old to enjoy it, then both she and I would rest, and what was to hinder us from going to live in England? England was still her promised land. I put no obstacle in her way, raised no objection. I knew she was not one who could live quiescent and inactive, or even comparatively, comparatively inactive. Duties she must have to fulfill, and important duties, work to do, an exciting, absorbing, profitable work. Strong faculties stirred in her frame, and they demanded full nourishment, free exercise. Mine was not the hand ever to starve or cramp them. No, I delighted in offering them sustenance and in clearing them wider space for action. You have conceived a plan, Francis, said I, and a good plan. Execute it. You have my free consent, and wherever and whenever my assistance is wanted, ask and you shall have. Francis' eyes thanked me almost with tears, just a sparkle or two soon brushed away. She possessed herself of my hand too, and held it for some time very close clasped in both her own, but she said no more than, thank you, monsieur. We passed a divine day and came home late, lighted by a full summer moon. Ten years rushed now upon me with dusty, vibrating, unresting wings, years of bustle, action, unselect endeavor, years in which I and my wife, having launched ourselves in the full career of progress, as progress whirls on in European capitals, capitals scarcely knew repose, were strangers to amusement, never thought of indulgence, and yet, as our course ran side by side, as we marched hand in hand, we neither murmured, repented, nor faltered. Hope indeed cheered us. Health kept us up. Harmony of thought and deed smoothed many difficulties. And finally, success bestowed every now and then encouraging reward on diligence. Our school became one of the most popular in Brussels, and as by degrees we raised our terms and elevated our system of education, our choice of pupils grew more select and at length included the children of the best families in Belgium. We had to an excellent connection in England, first opened by the unsolicited recommendation of Mr. Hunston, who having been over and having abused me for my prosperity in set terms, went back and soon after sent a leash of young Shire Harris's, his cousins, as he said, to be polished off by Mrs. Crimsworth. As to this same Mrs. Crimsworth, in one sense she was become another woman, though in another sense she remained unchanged. So different was she under different circumstances. I seemed to possess two wives. The faculties of her nature, already disclosed when I married her, remained fresh and fair. But other faculties shot up strong, ranged out broad, and quite altered the external character of the plant. Firmness, activity, and enterprise, covered with grey foliage, poetic feeling and fervour. But these flowers were still there, preserved pure and dewy under the umbrage of later growth and hardier nature. Perhaps I only in the world knew the secret of their existence. But to me, they were ever ready to yield an exquisite fragrance and present a beauty as chaste as radiant. In the daytime, my house and establishment were conducted by Madame the di Directress, a stately and elegant woman, very much anxious thought on her large brow, much calculated dignity in her serious mien. Immediately after breakfast, I used to part with this lady. I went to my college, she to her schoolroom, returning for an hour in the course of the day. I found her always in class, intently occupied, silence, industry, observance, attending on her presence. When not actually teaching, she was overlooking and guiding by eye and gesture. She then appeared vigilant and solicitous. When communicating instruction, her aspect was more animated. She seemed to feel a certain enjoyment in the occupation. The language in which she addressed her pupils, though simple and unpretending, was never trite or dry. She did not speak from routine formulas. She made her own phrases as she went on, and very nervous and impressive phrases they frequently were. Often, when elucidating favorite points of history or geography, she would wax genuinely eloquent in her earnestness. Her pupils, or at least the elder and more intelligent amongst them, recognized well the language of a superior mind. They felt too, and some of them received the impression of elevated sentiments. There was little fondling between mistress and girls, but some of Frances' pupils in time learned to love her sincerely. All of them beheld her with respect. 
her general demeanor towards them was serious, sometimes benignant when they pleased her with their progress and attention, always scrupulously refined and considerate. In cases where reproof or punishment was called for, she was usually forbearing enough. But if any took advantage of that forbearance, which sometimes happened, a sharp, sudden, and lightning-like severity taught the culprit the extent of the mistake committed. Sometimes a gleam of tenderness softened her eyes and manner, but this was rare. Only when a pupil was sick, or when it pined after home, or in the case of some little motherless child, or of one much poorer than its companions, whose scanty wardrobe and mean appointments brought on on it the, the contempt of the jeweled young countesses and silk-clad misses. Over such feeble fledgl fledglings, the directress spread a wing of kindliest protection. It was to their bedside she came at night to tuck them warmly in. It was after them she looked in winter to see that they always had a comfortable seat by the stove. It was they who by turns were summoned to the salon to receive some little dole of cake or fruit, to sit on a footstool at the fireside, to enjoy home comforts and almost home liberty. For an evening together, to be spoken to gently and softly, comforted, encouraged, cherished, and when bedtime came, dismissed with a kiss of true tenderness. As to Julia and Georgiana G., daughters of an English baronet, as to Mademoiselle Mathilde, heiress of a Belgian count, and sundry other children of patrician race, the directress was careful of them as of the others, anxious for their progress as for that of the rest, but it never seemed to enter her head to distinguish them by a mark of preference. One girl of noble blood she loved dearly, a young Irish baroness, Lady Catherine, but it was for her enthusiastic heart and clever head, for her generosity and her genius, the title and rank went for nothing. My afternoons were spent also in college, with the exception of an hour that my wife daily exacted of me for her establishment and with which she would not dispense. She said that I must spend that time amongst her pupils to learn their characters, to be au courant with everything that was passing in the house, to become interested in what interested her, to be able to give her my opinion on knotty points when she required it. And this she did constantly, never allowing my interest in the pupils to fall asleep, and never making any change of importance without my cognizance and consent. She delighted to sit by me when I gave my lessons, lessons in literature, her hands folded on her knee, the most fixedly attentive of any present. She rarely addressed me in class. When she did, it was with an air of marked deference. It was her pleasure, her joy to make me still the master in all things. At six o'clock p.m. my daily labors ceased. I then came home, for my home was my heaven. Ever at that hour, as I entered our private sitting room, the lady directress vanished from before my eyes, and Francis Henri, my own little lace mender, was magically restored to my arms. Much disappointed she would have been if her master had not been as constant to the trust as herself, and if this and if his truthful kiss had not been prompt to answer her soft bonsoir, monsieur. Talk French to me she would, and many a punishment she has had for her willfulness. I fear the choice of chastisement must have been injudicious, for instead of correcting the fault, it seemed to encourage its renewal. Our evenings were our own. That recreation was necessary to refresh our strength for the due discharge of our duties. Sometimes we spent them all in conversation, and my young Genevieve, now that she was thoroughly accustomed to her English professor, now that she loved him too absolutely to fear him much, reposed in him a confidence so unlimited that topics of conversation could no more be wanting with him than subjects for communion with her own heart. In those moments, happy as a bird with its mate, she would show me what she had of vivacity, of mirth, of originality in her well-dowered nature. She would show, too, some stores of raillery, of malice, and would vex, tease, pique me sometimes about what she called my bizarries anglaises, my caprices insulaires, with a wild and witty wickedness that made a perfect white demon of her while it lasted. This was rare, however, and the elfish freak was always short. Sometimes when driven a little hard in the war of words, for her tongue did ample justice to the peace, the point, the delicacy of her native French, in which language she always attacked me. I used to turn upon her with my old decision and arrest bodily the sprite that teased me. Vain idea. 
No sooner had I grasped the hand or arm than, than the elf was gone, the provocative smile quenched in the expressive brown eyes, and a ray of gentle homage shone under the lids in its place. I had seized a mere vexing fairy and found a submissive and supplicating little mortal woman in my arms. Then I made her get a book and read English to me for an hour by way of penance. I frequently dosed her with Wordsworth in this way, and Wordsworth steadied her soon. She had a difficulty in comprehending his deep, serene, and sober mind. His language, too, was not facile to her. She had to ask questions, to sue for explanations, to be like a child and a novice, and to acknowledge me as her senior and director. Her instinct instantly penetrated and possessed the meaning of more ardent and imaginative writers. Byron excited her, Scott she loved, Wordsworth only she puzzled at, wondered over, and hesitated to pronounce an opinion upon. But whether she read to me or talked with me, whether she teased me in French or entreated me in English, whether she jested with wit or inquired with deference, narrated with interest or listened with attention, whether she smiled at me or on me, always at nine o'clock I was left abandoned. She would extricate herself from my arms, quit my side, take her lamp and be gone. Her mission was upstairs. I have followed her sometimes and watched her. First, she opened the door of the dortoir, the pupil's chamber. Noiselessly, she glided up the long room between the two rows of white beds, surveyed all the sleepers. If any were wakeful, especially if any were sad, spoke to them and soothed them, stood some minutes to ascertain that all was safe and tranquil, trimmed the watchlight which burned in the apartment all night, then withdrew, closing the door behind her without sound. Then she glided to our own chamber, it had a little cabinet within. This she sought. There too appeared a bed, but one, and that a very small one. Her face, the night I followed and observed her, changed as she approached this tiny couch. From grave it warmed to earnest. She shaded with one hand the lamp she held in the other. She bent above the pillow and hung over a child asleep. Its slumber, that evening at least, and usually I believe, was sound and calm. No tear wet its dark eyelashes, no fever heated its round cheeks, no ill dream discomposed its budding features. Frances gazed, she did not smile, and yet the deepest delight filled flushed her face. Feeling pleasurable, powerful worked in her whole frame, which still was motionless. I saw indeed her heart heave, her lips were a little apart, her breathing grew somewhat hurried. The child smiled. Then, at last, the mother smiled too and said in low soliloquy, God bless my little son. So they have a child together. Beautiful. She stooped closer over him, breathed the softest of kisses on his brow, covered his minute hand with hers, and at last started up and came away. I regained the parlor before her. Entering it two minutes later, she said quietly as she put down her extinguished lamp, Victor rests well. He smiled in his sleep. He has your smile, monsieur. So she takes care of all her children. Her pupils are also her children. She goes, takes a look at each one of them to check if they are sleeping well. And then she goes to her own son to check if he's sleeping well. And although her um, countenance, her body does not um, show anything, any signs of excitement, monsieur, who was watching her, sees her heart heaves. It's a love for her child. The sad Victor was, of course, her own boy, born in the third year of our marriage. His Christian name had been given him in honor of Monsieur van der Hatten, who continued always our trusty and well-beloved friend. Frances was then a good and dear wife to me, because I was to her a good, just, and faithful husband. What she would have been had she married a harsh, envious, careless man, a profligate, a prodigal, a drunkard, or a tyrant, is another question, and one which I once propounded to her. Her answer, given after some reflection, was, I should have tried to endure the evil or cure it for a while, and when I found it intolerable and incurable, I should have left my torture suddenly and silently. And if law or might had forced you back again, what, to a drunkard, a profligate, a selfish spendthrift, or an unjust fool? Yes, I would have gone back again. Again assured myself whether or not his vice and my misery were capable of remedy, and if not, have left him again. 
and if again forced to return and compelled to abide? I don't know, she said hastily. Why do you ask me, monsieur? I would, I would have an answer because I saw a strange kind of spirit in her eye, whose voice I determined to waken. Monsieur, if my wife's nature loathes that of the man she is wedded to, marriage must be slavery. Against slavery, all right thinkers revolt, and though torture be the price of resistance, torture must be dared. Though the only road to freedom lie through the gates of death, those gates must be passed, for freedom is indispensable. Then, monsieur, I would resist as far as my strength permitted. When that strength failed, I should be sure of a refuge. Death would certainly screen me both from bad laws and their consequences. Look how she has changed and um or perhaps it was always deep inside her and at the end of the book she becomes the protagonist which is really really interesting um and she says that she would not abide to being um uh, enslaved in an abusive marriage she would leave no matter how many times she would be forced to come back she would leave voluntary death francis no, monsieur, I'd have courage to live out every throw of anguish fate assigned me, and principle to contend for justice and liberty to the last. I see you would have made no patient grizzle. And now, supposing fate had merely assigned you the lot of an old maid, what then? How would you have liked celibacy? Not much, certainly. An old maid's life must doubtless be void and vapid, her heart strained and empty. Had I been an old maid, I should have spent existence in efforts to fill the void and ease the aching. I should have probably failed and died weary and disappointed, despised and of no account, like other single women. But I'm not an old maid, she added quickly. I should have been, though, but for my master. I should never have suited any man but Professor Crimsworth. No other gentleman, French, English, or Belgium, would have thought me amiable or handsome, and I doubt whether I should have cared for the approbation of many others, if I could have obtained it. Now I have been Professor Crimsworth's wife eight years, and what is he in my eyes? Is he honorable, beloved? She stopped. Her voice was cut off, her eyes suddenly suffused. She and I were standing side by side. She threw her arms around me and strained me to her heart with passionate earnestness. The energy of her whole being glowed in her dark and then dilated eye and crimsoned her animated cheek. Her look and movement were like inspiration. In one there was such a flesh, in the other such a power. Half an hour afterwards, when she had become calm, I asked where all that wild vigor was gone, which had transformed her erewhile and made her glance so thrilling and ardent her action so rapid and strong she looked down smiling softly and passively i cannot tell where it is gone monsieur said she but i know that whenever it is wanted it will come back again behold us now at the close of the ten years and we have realized an independency the rapidity with which we attained this end had its origin in three reasons firstly we worked so hard for it Secondly, we had no encumbrances to delay success. Thirdly, as soon as we had capital to invest, two well-skilled counselors, one in Belgium, one in England, this Waldenhanten and Hansen, gave us each a word of advice as to the sort of investment to be chosen. The suggestion made was judicious, and being promptly acted on, the result proved gainful. I did not say how gainful. I communicated details to Messieurs Vandenhutten and Hansen. Nobody else can be interested in hearing them. Accounts being wound up and our professional connection disposed of, we both agreed that as Mammon was not our master, nor his service that in which we desired to spend our lives, as our desires were temperate and our habits unostentatious, we had now abundance to live on, abundance to leave our boy, and should besides always have a balance on hand, which, properly managed by right sympathy and unselfish activity, might help philanthropy in her enterprises and put solace into the hand of charity. To England we now resolved to take wing. We arrived there safely. Frances realized the dream of her lifetime. We spent a whole summer and autumn in traveling from end to end of the British islands, and afterwards passed a winter in London. Then we thought it high time to fix our residence. My heart yearned towards my native county of Shire, and it is in Shire I now live. 
It is in the library of my own home I am now writing. That home lies amid a sequestered and rather hilly region, 30 miles removed from X, a region whose verdure the smoke of mills has not yet sullied, whose waters still run pure, whose swells of moorland preserve in some ferny glens that lie between them the very primal whiteness of nature. Her moss, her bracken, her blue bells, her sense of reed and heather, her free and fresh breezes. My house is a picturesque and not too spacious dwelling, with low and long windows, trellised and leaf-veiled porch over the front door, just now on this summer evening looking like an arch of roses and ivy. So now ten years have passed, and we are reading as he writes in his library in his own home in England, and it is now the present time. The garden is chiefly laid out in lawn, formed of the sod of the hills, with herbert short and soft as moss, full of its own peculiar flowers, tiny and star-like, embedded in the minute embroidery of their fine foliage. At the bottom of the sloping garden there is a wicket, which opens upon a lane as green as a lawn, very long, shady, and little frequented. On the turf, on the turf of this lane generally appear the first daisies of spring, whence its name, Daisy Lane, serving also as a distinction to the house. It terminates, the lane I mean, in a valley full of wood, which wood, chiefly oak and beech, spreads shadowy about the vicinage of a very old mansion, one of the Elizabethan structures, much larger as well as more antique than Daisy Lane, the property and residence of an individual familiar both to me and to the reader. Yes, in Hunston Wood, for so are those glades and that grey building with many gables and more chimneys named, abides York Hunston, still unmarried, never, I suppose, having yet found his ideal, though I know at least a score of young ladies within a circuit of forty miles who would be willing to assist him in this search. The state fell to him by the death of his father five years hence, five years since. He has given up trade after having made by it sufficient to pay off some encumbrances by which the family heritage was burdened. I say he abides here, but I do not think he's resident above five months out of the twelve. He wanders from land to land and spends some part of each winter in town. He frequently brings visitors with him when he comes to Shire, and these visitors are often foreigners. Sometimes he has a German metaphysician, sometimes a French savant. He had once a dissatisfied and savage-looking Italian who neither sang nor played, and of whom Francis affirmed that he had tout l'air d'un conspirateur. <laughs> he had the air of a conspirator. What English guests Hunston invites are all either men of Birmingham or Manchester, hard men seemingly knit up in one thought, whose talk is of free trade. The foreign visitors, too, are politicians. They take a wider theme, European progress, the spread of liberal sentiments over the continent. On their mental tablets, the names of Russia, Austria, and the Pope are inscribed in red ink. I have heard some of them talk vigorous sense. Yeah, I have been present at polyglot discussions in the old oak-lined dining room at Hunston Wood, where a singular insight was given of the sentiments entertained by resolute minds respecting old northern despotisms and old southern superstitions. Also, I have heard much twaddle announced chiefly in French and Deutsch, but let that pass. Hunston himself tolerates the driveling theorists, with the practical men he seemed leagued hand and heart. When Hunston is staying alone at the wood, which seldom happens, he generally finds his way two or three times a week to Daisy Lane. He has a philanthropic motive for coming to smoke his cigar in our porch on summer evenings. He says he does it to kill the earwigs amongst the roses with which insects, but for his benevolent fumigations, he intimates we should certainly be overrun. On wet days, too, we are almost sure to see him. According to him, it gets on time to work me into lunacy by treading on my mental corns or to force from Mrs. Crimsworth revelations of the dragon within her by insulting the memory of Hoffer and Tell. We also go frequently to Hunston Wood and both I and Francis relish a visit there highly. If there are other guests, their characters are an interesting study. Their conversation is exciting and strange. The absence of all local narrowness, both in the host and his chosen society, gives a metropolitan, almost a cosmopolitan freedom and largeness to the talk. Hansen himself is a polite man in his own house. He has, when he chooses to employ it, an exhaustible power of entertaining guests. His very mention, too, is interesting. 
The rooms look storied, the passages legendary. legendary. The low ceiled chambers with their long rows, rows of diamond paint lattices have an old world haunted air. In his travels, he has collected stores of articles of vertu, which are well and tastefully disposed in his paneled or tapestried rooms. I have seen there one or two pictures and one or two pieces of statuary which many an aristocratic connoisseur might have envied. When I and Francis have dined and spent an evening with Hunston, he often walks home with us. His wood is large and some of the timber is old and of huge growth. There are winding ways in it which, pursued through glade and brake, make the walk back to Daisy Lane a somewhat long one. Many a time when we have had the benefit of a full moon, and when the night has been mild and balmy, when, moreover, a certain nightingale has been singing, and a certain stream, hid in alders, has lent the song of a soft accompaniment, the remote church bell of the one hamlet in a district of ten miles has tolled midnight ere the lord of the wood left us at our porch. Free-flowing was his talk at such hours, and far more quiet and gentle than in the daytime, and before numbers. He would then forget politics and discussion, and would dwell on the pastimes of his house, on his family history, on himself and his own feelings. Subjects each and all invested with a peculiar zest, for they were each and all unique. One glorious night in June, after I had been taunting him about his ideal bride and asking him when she would come and graft her foreign beauty on the old Hunsden Oak, he answered suddenly, You call her ideal, but see, here is her shadow, and there cannot be a shadow without a substance. He had led us from the depth of the winding way into a glade from whence the beaches withdrew, leaving it open to the sky. An unclouded moon poured her light into this glade, and Hunston held out under her beam an ivory miniature. Francis, with eagerness, examined it first. That's the shadow of his ideal, so that's a portrait. And if this is the shadow, then the substance exists somewhere, right? Francis, with eagerness, examined it first. Then she gave it to me. Still, however, pushing her little face close to mine and seeking in my eyes what I thought of the portrait. I thought it represented a very handsome and very individual looking female face with, as he had once said, straight and harmonious features. It was dark, the hair raven black, swept not only from the brow but from the temples, seemed thrust away carelessly as if such beauty dispensed with, nay, despised arrangement. The Italian eye looked straight into you and an independent, determined eye it was. The mouth was as firm as fine, the chin ditto, on the back of the miniature was gilded, Lucia. That is a real hat, was my conclusion. Hunston smiled. I think so, he replied. All was real in Lucia. And she was somebody you would have liked to marry, but could not. I should certainly have liked to marry her, and that I have not done so is a proof that I could not. He repossessed himself of the miniature, now again in Francis' hand, and put it away. What do you think of it? He asked of my wife as he buttoned his coat over it. I'm sure Lucia once wore chains and broke them, was the strange answer. I do not mean matrimonial chains, she added, correcting herself as if she feared misinterpretation, but social chains of some sort. The face is that of one who has made an effort, and a successful and triumphant effort, to wrest some vigorous and valued faculty from insupportable constraint. And when Lucia's faculty got free, I am certain it spread wide pinions and carried her higher than... She hesitated. Then what? demanded Hunston. Don't les convenances permitted you to follow. I think you grow spiteful, impertinent. Lucia has trodden the stage, continued Francis. You never seriously thought of marrying her. You admire her originality, her fearlessness, her energy of body and mind. You delighted in her talent, whatever that was, whether song, dance, or dramatic representation. You worshipped her beauty, which was of the sort after your own heart. But I am sure she filled a sphere from whence you would never have thought of taking a wife. So she solved the mystery. Francis solved the mystery. Hunsden had been in love with an actress, someone he admired and wanted to marry, but would never because of the public uh, sphere, the artistic sphere and working sphere from uh, uh, where she was from. Ingenious, remarked Hunsden, 
Whether true or not is another question. Meantime, don't you feel your little lamp of her spirit walks very pale beside such a girondole as Lucia's? Yes, candid at least, and the professor will soon be dissatisfied with the dim light you give. Will you, monsieur? My sight was always too weak to endure a blaze, Francis, and we had now reached the wicket. I said a few pages back that this is a sweet summer evening. It is. There has been a series of lovely days, and this is the loveliest. The hay is just carried from my fields. Its perfume still lingers in the air. Francis proposed to me an hour or two since to take tea out on the lawn. I see the round table loaded, loaded with china placed under a certain beech. Hansen is expected. Nay, I hear he is come. There is his voice laying down the law on some point with authority. That of Francis replies. She opposes him, of course. They are disputing about Victor, of whom Hunston affirms that his mother is making a milk sop. Mrs. Crimsworth retaliates. Better a thousand times he should be a milk sop than what he, Hunston, calls a fine lad. And moreover, she says that if Hunston were to become a fixture in the neighborhood and were not a mere comet coming and going, no one knows how, when, where, or why she should be quite uneasy till she had got Victor away to a school at least a hundred miles off. For that was... For that, with his mutinous maxims, maxims and unpractical dogmas, he would ruin a score of children. I have a word to say of Victor ere I shut this manuscript in my desk, but it must be a brief one, for I hear the tinkle of silver on porcelain. Victor is as little of a pretty child as I am of a handsome man, or his mother of a fine woman. He is pale and spare, with large eyes, as dark as those of Francis, and as deeply set as mine. His shape is symmetrical enough, but slight. His health is good. I never saw a child smile less than he does, nor one who needs such a formidable brow when sitting over a book that interests him, or while listening to tales of adventure, peril, or wonder narrated by his mother, Hunston, or myself. But though still, he is not unhappy, though serious, not morose. He has a susceptibility to pleasurable sensations almost too keen for it amounts to enthusiasm. He learned to read in the old-fashioned way out of a spelling book at his mother's knee, and as he got on without driving by that method, she thought it unnecessary to buy him ivory letters, or to try any of the other inducements to learning now deemed indispensable. When he could read, he became a glutton of books, and is so still. His toys have been few, and he has never wanted more. For those he possesses, he seems to have contracted a partiality amounting to affection, this feeling, directed towards one or two living animals of the house, strengthens almost to a passion. Mr. Hunston gave him a mastiff cub, which he called York, after the donor. It grew to a superb dog, whose fierceness, however, was much modified by the companionship and caresses of its young master. He would go nowhere, do nothing, without York. York lay at his feet while he learned his lessons played with him in the garden, walked with him in the lane and wood, sat near his chair at meals, was fed always by his own hand, was the first thing he sought in the morning, the last he left at night. York accompanied Mr. Hunston one day to Ax and was bitten in the street by a dog in a rabid state. As soon as Hunston had brought him home and had informed me of the circumstance, I went into the yard and shot him where he lay licking his wound. He was dead in an instant. He had not seen me level the gun. I stood behind him. I had scarcely been ten minutes in the house when my ear was struck with sounds of anguish. I repaired to the yard once more, for they proceeded thence. Victor was kneeling beside his dead mastiff, bent over it, embracing its bull-like neck, and lost in a passion of the wildest woo. He saw me. Oh, Papa, I'll never forgive you. I'll never forgive you, was his exclamation. You shot York. I saw it from the window. I never believed you could be so cruel. I can love you no more. I had much ado to explain to him, with a steady voice, the stern necessity of the deed. He is still with that inconsolable and bitter accent which I cannot render, but which pierced my heart repeated. He might have been cured. You should have tried. You should have burned the wound with a hot iron or covered it with caustic. You gave no time, and now it is too late. He is dead. He sank fairly down on the senseless car on the senseless. Senseless carcass. 
I waited patiently a long while till his grief had somewhat exhausted him, and then I lifted him in my arms and carried him to his mother, sure that she would comfort him best. She had witnessed the whole scene from a window. She would not come out for fear of increasing my difficulties by her emotion, but she was ready now to receive him. She took him to her kind heart and onto her gentle lap, consoled him but with her lips, her eyes, her soft embrace for some time, and then, when his sobs diminished, told him that York had felt no pain in dying and that if he had been left to expire naturally, his end would have been most horrible. Above all, she told him that I was not cruel, for that idea seemed to give exquisite pain to poor Victor, that it was my affection for York and him which had made me act so, and that I was now almost heartbroken to see him weep thus bitterly. Victor would have been no true son of his father had these considerations, these reasons, breathed in so low, so sweet a tone, married to caresses so benign, so tender, to look so inspired with pitying sympathy, produced no effect on him. They did produce an effect. He grew calmer, rested his face on her shoulder, and lay still in her arms. Looking up shortly, he asked his mother to tell him over again what she had said about York having suffered no pain and my not being cruel. The balmy words being repeated, he again pillowed his cheek on her breast and was again tranquil. Some hours after, he came to me in my library, asked if I forgave him and desired to be reconciled. I drew the lad to my side, and there I kept him a good while and had much talk with him in the course of which he disclosed many points of feeling and thought I approved of in my son. I found, it is true, few elements of the good fellow or the fine fellow in him. Scant sparkles of the spirit which loves to flash over the wine cup or which kindles the passions to a destroying fire. But I saw in the soil of his heart healthy and swelling germs of compassion, affection, fidelity. I discovered in the garden of his intellect a rich growth of wholesome principles. Reason, justice, moral courage promised, if not blighted, a fertile bearing. So I bestowed on his large forehead and on his cheek still pale with tears, a proud and contented kiss, and sent him away comforted. Yet I saw him the next day laid on the mound under which York had been buried, his face covered with his hands. He was melancholy for some weeks, and more than a year elapsed before he would listen to any proposal of having another dog. Victor learns fast, he must soon go to Eton, where I suspect his first year or two will be utter wretchedness. To leave me, his mother, and his home will give his heart an agonized wrench. Then the fagging will not suit him, but emulation, thirst after knowledge, the glory of success will stir and reward him in time. Meantime, I feel in myself a strong repugnance to fix the hour which will uproot my sole olive branch and transplant it far from me. And when I speak to Francis on the subject, I am hurt with a kind of patient pain, as though I alluded to some fearful operation at which her nature shudders but from which her fortitude will not permit her to recoil. The step must, however, be taken, and it shall be. For though Frances will not make a milksop of her son, she will accustom him to a style of treatment, a forbearance, a congenial tenderness he will meet with from none else. She sees, as I also see, something in Victor's temper, a kind of electrical ardor and power which emits now and then ominous sparks. Hunston calls it his spirit and says it should not be curbed. I call it the leaven of the offending Adam, and consider that it should be, if not whipped out of him, at least soundly disciplined, and that he will be cheap of any amount of either bodily or mental suffering, which will ground him radically in the art of self-control. Frances gives this something in her son's market character no name, but when it appears in the grinding of his teeth, in the glittering of his eye, in the fierce revolt of feeling against disappointment, mischance, sudden sorrow, or supposed injustice, she folds him to her breast or takes him to walk with her alone in the wood. Then she reasons with him like any philosopher, and to reason Victor is ever accessible. Then she looks at him with eyes of love, and by love Victor can be infallibly subjugated. But will reason or love be the weapons with which in future the world will meet his violence? Oh no, for that flash in his black eye, for that cloud on his bony brown, for that compression of his statuesque lips, the lad will some day get blows instead of blandishments, kicks instead of kisses. Then, for the fit of mute fury which will sicken his body and madden his soul, 
than for the ordeal of merited and salutary suffering, out of which he will come, I trust, a wiser and a better man. I see him now. He stands by Hunston, who is seated on the lawn under the beach. Hunston's hand rests on the boy's collar, and he is instilling God knows what principles into his ear. Victor looks well just now, for he listens with a sort of smiling interest. He never looks so like his mother as when he smiles. Pity the sunshine breaks out so rarely. Victor has a preference for Hunston, full as strong as I deem desirable, being considerably more potent decided and indiscriminating than any I ever entertained for the personage myself. Frances too regards it with a sort of unexpressed anxiety. While her, while her son leans on Hunston's knee or rests against his shoulder, she roves with restless movement round like a dove guarding its young from a hovering hawk. She says she wishes Hunston had children of his own, for then he would better know the danger of inciting their pride and indulging their foibles. Frances approaches my library window, puts aside the honeysuckle which half covers it, and tells me tea is ready. Seeing that I continue busy, she enters the room, comes near me quietly, and puts her hand on my shoulder. Monsieur est trop appliqué. I shall soon have done. She draws a chair near and sits down to wait till I have finished. Her presence is as pleasant to my mind as the perfume of the fresh hay and spicy flowers, as the glow of the westering sun, as the repose of the midsummer eve are to my senses. But husband comes. I hear his step, and there he is, bending through the lattice, from which he has thrust away the woodbine with unsparing hand, disturbing two bees and a butterfly. Grimsworth! I say, Crimsworth, take that pen out of his hand, mistress, and make him lift up his head. Well, Hunston, I hear you. I was at X yesterday. Your brother Ned is getting richer than Chris's by railway speculations. They call him in the Peace Hall a stag of ten, and I have heard from Brown, M Monsieur and Madame van der Hutten and Jean-Baptiste talk of coming to see you next month. He mentions the Palais, too. He says their domestic harmony is not the finest in the world, but in business they are doing on ne peu mieux. Cannot do any better. Which circumstance, he concludes, will be a sufficient consolation to both for any little crosses in the affections. Why don't you invite the Palais to Shire, Crimsworth? I should so like to see your first flame, Zoraide. Mistress, don't be jealous, but he loved that lady to distraction. I know it for a fact. Brown says she weighs 12 stones now. You see what you've lost, Miss, Mr. Professor. Now, Monsieur and Madame, if you don't come to tea, Victor and I will begin without you. Papa, come. And this is the end of The Professor by Charles Bronte with this picture of domestic felicity. And it's such an, a nice ending. So we, we follow William Crimsworth in his journey from boyhood to adulthood from um a lonely existence working a lot to get what he wanted perseverance meeting someone with a similar mind set that is francis and how they together built a school built their um a sufficient they didn't want more than what was sufficient sufficient income to give them the freedom the independence to move to england and to live their life with their son and their friend mr hunston so there we are i hope you enjoy this series of guided readings of the professor and i would love to know which book you would like to read and discuss with me next leave your uh, suggestion in the comments below and of course, I would love to welcome you to one of my courses or workshops at Books and Culture and to guide you in other meaningful literary journeys. So thank you for joining me in this one and I'll see you next time.